All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yassine. I uh, work uh, in research at Karma. And I uh, was excited about some machine learning. <laughs> Woo! Yes. I heard that I haven't started presenting yet, and I already have some questions. So I guess I'll answer them later. Don't forget. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about our progress in learning a driving simulator. Um, so it's been uh, a few months of, of, of this project, and uh, we have some exciting results, and I would like to talk to you about them. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to show you approximately where we're heading after this presentation. So as you might have guessed, none of these videos are real. All of them are imagined. All of them are, are uh, predicted using a machine learning model uh, of which we give a few frames of context and then ask the model to predict the next few frames in here, uh, about a minute of frames. And uh, yeah, as you can see, the videos look pretty good. Um, the temporal consistency is pretty good too. Um, so this is a minute of rollout, as I said. Um, they, they exhibit some really nice properties. You can see that um, some physics is learned, some, some great dynamics is learned as well. Uh, for the night videos, uh, you can also see that the lighting looks pretty good, uh, which is something we really care about. Um, and I will come back to this slide after we're done, but pretty much by the end of, of this presentation, you should pretty much understand uh, how we built this and why is it useful to us and what are our next steps. But before, let's go back to the basics. Why do we even need a simulator? Harold talked about this this morning. We've talked about this two years ago in uh, the previous Comic-Con. Why even a simulator? Um, without a simulator, the driving model will never be exposed to any kind of significant noise or any kind of significant deviations, especially the noise introduced from its own mistakes. So if we train a model outside of a simulator, without a simulator, uh, what's going to happen is if you end up outside of the center of the lane, the model will always say, um, just keep doing whatever you're doing and recover later, recover in a few seconds. And the next second, it will also do the same thing. Also say, yeah, you're, you're pretty good. Just, just keep going and then recover the center um, in a few seconds. And the result of this is what you see in the bottom video. It's uh, basically a model that doesn't recover to the center of the lane and uh, just drifts outside of the lane. So this is a problem and we need a simulator for this. Now, a good question to ask ourselves as well is, why not a classical simulator? Why do all these complicated things? Why not just build a Unity or an Unreal Engine simulator, a GTA 5 kind of simulator, and why not just do that? Well, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. Uh, these simulators are good for testing. We want them. We want them for testing because they're good for um, you know, the, the deterministic, they're fully, um, you can build whatever you want, you can build whatever scenario, but we want to use this for training. And training it is a whole different beast. First of all, you need to match the training distribution. You need to match the real world distribution of driving data. And what is even that? How do you even quantify that? And how do you even know that you did, that you matched the, the real world? And even if you tried to do this, you would actually need to hard code a bunch of scenarios, a lot of them, and every day you'll just be building a simulator. You never do self-driving, you'll just be building a simulator. And that's not really a business that we want to be in. Um, so as you understand, as you might understand, this is not a scalable solution. You don't want to be hard coding simulators for training, at least. So we came up with this thing called the small offset simulator. And Harold talked about this this morning as well. It's basically a uh, simulator in which we shift the image a little to the right, a little to the left, a little to the forward, a little backward, uh, to simulate little movements uh, from the original position. And when we train the model in this simulator, in closed loop, we actually see driving. We see a model that recovers. We see a model that stops for stop signs. We see a model that stops for red lights. And this is quite amazing. So this is a small offset simulator. And that's what we've been running with for a few years now. Uh, but as you might have guessed, we're trying to uh, pa go, go past it. So why are we even trying to go past it? What's wrong with it? Well, Harold hinted at, at the problem this morning, uh, which we call cheating. So uh, in order to have a very good simulator of the sort, of this small offset simulation, 
you want to have really good ground truth. You want to have good height estimation, good road plane estimation, uh, good pose estimation, so many good things. They need to be pretty much perfect. Uh, and the problem is, as soon as you start to get some imperfection, some error, uh, you will have um, simulator artifacts. And those artifacts um, can tell the model which way, which way you came from, or how to, how to drive, basically. So the model will learn how to drive just by looking at the artifacts instead of learning how to drive like a normal human being. And trust me, the model knows how to cheat. So this is the first problem. The second problem is, well, it's in the title. It's a small offset simulator. It's not a big offset simulator. Um, so as, as long as, as soon as we try to do some kind of big offsets, you can see that the images look very funky. And they really don't look that good. You don't want to drive in this world. Um, and that really doesn't matter for lateral that much because you don't deviate so much left to right uh, while uh, driving laterally. But in longitudinal, this makes a big difference. At highway speeds, plus minus 10 miles an hour, it's really a big distance. So uh, you really want big offset simulator for longitudinal. So this is it. This is uh, our state right now. And why do we want to go past it? So how do we do this? Well, I'll tell uh, some history here. In 2016, Edder and George wrote a paper called Learning a Driving Simulator. And I stole the title of my presentation from this paper. Um, you don't have to read the paper. You can read it if you want. But I'm going to basically explain what the paper is about today. Um, the paper basically described what we're doing now. It's just read 2016 tech. We don't want to be doing 2016 machine learning. We want today's machine learning. 2016 machine learning sucks. This is what, what 2016 machine learning give you. And um, as you saw in the first slide, 2023 machine learning is a lot better than this. So what's an ML simulator? So we're trying to build an ML simulator. An ML simulator is basically three parts, three components. Um, and I'm going to go into each component separately and explain what it does. And uh, yeah, by the end, uh, we'll go back to our first slide. So three components, image tokenizer, a post tokenizer, and the dynamic transformer. I will explain every part separately. So an image tokenizer is basically a fancy image compressor. It's an ML image compressor that takes in images and compresses them into a set of tokens. Now, what's a token? A token is just a fancy name for a discrete number, a number that can only attend a, a small set of, of values from a dictionary. So taking images, images is a lot of pixels, um, then encodes them into this set of tokens that are discrete. Usually, these tokens are not too much, 128, 512 tokens. And um, then with this tokenizer, usually comes a, a detokenizer, or an image decoder, that can bring you back to image space, and in which you can see what you actually compressed, and then compare it. Uh, this model is trained with a GAN loss, with a generative adversarial loss. And uh, this is what is usually referred to as a VQ GAN. Um, so yes, this is a, uh, our image tokenizer. And uh, in this slide, I show uh, from left to right uh, a source image, an image compressed to 5,120 bits, and an image compressed to 1,280 bits. So I want to point out a few details here that are, that are pretty interesting. Uh, do you notice this ES logo here? Notice how it's a little funky around here, but it's still some red things around that area. But notice that the 1,280 bits just completely forgot about the CVS logo. You don't really need that. What, what do you need logos in life? Um, you can also notice that the building uh, a little at the distance here looks okay for the 512 for the 512 for 5,120 bit, bits image, but the 1280 image uh, looks pretty funky. Uh, the traffic light also looks a little funky. Um, so yeah, these are completely classical compression artifacts that we get here. Um, so the image, this image is there's a lot happening. There's a traffic light. There's a logo. There's buildings. Uh, so it's a complex image. For a pretty classic highway driving image, you really can't see the difference. This looks really similar to me. And um, so for highway driving, um, either 512 or 1200 
that really doesn't make that much difference. And in order to iterate fast, so we, we want to iterate fast, and we know we can improve the quality of our simulation by just scaling up the number of bits. In order to iterate fast, do some good experimentation, we're working now with this, with this model. But we know that in the future, as, as our models improve, we can always scale up and get better simulation. So for now, uh, 128 tokens, uh, 10 bits each. Now, what's a pose tokenizer? What, what's a pose to start with? The, the pose is basically six floating points numbers. Uh, they're six degrees of freedom, basically your x speed, y speed, z speed, and then uh, your roll rate, pitch rate, and uh, yaw rate. So we also need to, uh, to tokenize these numbers uh, just because of the next component that I'm going to talk about. But trust me, we need to do that. Um, and we tokenize them with a very simple tokenizer. We basically need to digitize them or to quantize them. So we just digitize them with the uniform binning, very simple, nothing fancy here. Um, now to the beefy part, the dynamics transformer. Who knows what a transformer is? Yes. Who's used ChatGPT? Same people, some people, more people. I see you. Cool. So yeah, a transformer is, is basically the same architecture as a large language model, ChatGPT, Llama, these kind of, these kind of models. Um, uh, for large language models, a token is, roughly speaking, one word. Um, a sentence is a set of tokens, and a document or a paragraph is a set of sets of tokens. For us, an image is a set of tokens. A video is a set of images, so a set of set of tokens. And uh, we train it with the same way the large language models people do. Uh, very nice loss function, cross entropy. Predict the next token. So uh, very similar to large, to large language models. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the architecture of a transformer. For those who don't know what a transformer is, it's basically a fancy machine learning architecture that's a stack of, of fully connected layers and attention layers. So just a black box of a machine learning architecture. So we use this dynamics transformer uh, one token at a time, so it's autoregressive sampling. Uh, at each time we ask the model, what, is, what do you think the next token will be? We take that token, plug that back in in the inputs, then ask, ask it again, what would be the next token? Plug that back in in the inputs and do this until we reach a number of frames. These number of frames will give us a, sorry, this number of tokens will give us a frame. We take that and then do this as many times as we want until we reach whatever number of frames we want. So this is what people usually refer to as autoregressive sampling. Um, autoregressive sampling. So predicting each uh, token at a time. So in theory, doing this is really powerful because um, you could cover the whole distribution of your training set. Um, so you could cover the, the whole distribution of possible rollouts given, um, given a context, given a few frames. Uh, this could imagine any type of futures, which is really desirable because you don't want to restrict whatever happened next, whatever the driving model that will be trained in this simulator, you don't want to restrict it to something specific. You want it to be as general as possible, and this is really desirable. We tried a few things um, to uh, speed up this autoregressive sampling, so it's a little slow. We're trying to speed it up. We tried something like uh, diffusion-like sampling, uh, some uh, fancy techniques with mass git and, and things like that, but we didn't really um, succeed at anything like that, but we'll keep trying and uh, um, something will, will work. And we basically want to speed up the autoregressive sampling, which is a little slow. So we do all this and it works. This is our uh, dynamics model, this is our simulator. So in here we just show it, we just tell it to drive straight. And as you can see, drive straight. Uh, it's a pretty nice highway drive, uh, straight driving. But we can also ask it to do some things like yank the steering wheel to the right. Turn right as much as you want. And as you can see, turns right, changes lanes, even goes out of the road, even drives on the grass. That's pretty impressive. I guess some people did that in the, tra in the training set. <laughs> Who did that? You can also tell it to turn left, cross the median, drive, in, drive to the opposite lane, even get close to oncoming traffic. Who did that? That's, okay, I don't want to know. 
You can also tell it to accelerate. So notice the uh, ley lines, it passes the traffic, uh, it passes some traffic. So as you can see, there's some acceleration happening in this, in this rollout. You can also tell it to brake. So again, notice the ley lines, they will slow down. Um, so as you can see, successfully brakes. And as a side note, we open sourced all this. We open sourced a data set of 100,000 minutes of driving, tokenized. So these are all tokenized with the tokenizer that I've showed before. We open sourced the image tokenizer and the image decoder. And we also open sourced a transformer that's very similar to the one I'm showing you today and that can generate rollouts that look like the one that I showed you today. Um, we also have two $1,000 bounties. So if anyone uh, feels um, feels like a weekend project. Uh, we want to decrease inference latency. We want to make this model run fast. Today they run at two FPS, so we want to run them really fast. Uh, so if you improve the training latency, the inference latency by 50%, you get a thousand dollars. And if you decrease training loss by five percent, you also get a thousand dollars. So if anyone wants a weekend project, really fun. Another side note. Um, and so I've been showing you all these images that went back to image space. So these videos that look good, it's always good that we can go back to image space and debug these dynamics, trans these dynamics models and see what happens. But in order to train a driving model, we actually don't need to go back to vision space. We don't need to go back to the image space. You can, you can train the model directly on the tokens, which is interesting. So these images are compressed to these tokens and the to these tokens have everything you need to know to drive, which is pretty cool. So instead of having like a convolutional neural network that takes in an image and predicts the plan and predicts the ley lines and, and such, um, now you have a transformer and then you have uh, a plan and the ley line and all that. And as you can see here, um, it works. It predicts the ley lines, predicts the plan, uh, predicts some reasonable outputs. So you don't need, we don't technically need to go back to vision space in order to train a model. We can directly train it on tokens, which is pretty nice. Another side note is that you've noticed that the images are a little flickery. So they jump a little bit, the clouds jump a little bit, the cars jump a little bit. So and we were aware of that. We know that our, our encoder is not smooth and that's because our encoder is frame by frame. There's no temporal consistency because there's no, nothing that's trained temporally. Um, so we want to fix that. Uh, then there's multiple ways you can fix this. We really want to have a tokenizer that's video based, that's not image based. What we're doing now is uh, a little naive. You don't want to do this frame by frame. You really want to do it for a set of frames to get some more, some more quantization. You can get more compression if you compress multiple frames. But uh, there's a technique that people have been trying and we tried that as well, is to have a, uh, to uh, just uh, freeze everything and then put a recurrent layer in your decoder which essentially gives the, the decoder uh, like a state that get passed from frame to frame and the decoder can use that uh, to smooth the rollout. So as you can see here, in the left is the raw rollout and uh, to the right is the smooth rollout. So much, more, much, much, much smoother. So this works. Um, another side note is, okay, how do we use this to train? How why and what's, what's the, what was missing for us to use this to train, um, we need a new loss function. And why do we need a new loss function? Uh, well, for sufficiently long rollout, um, the simulator is going to imagine things that were never in the context, right? It's, it's going to imagine traffic lights, it's going to imagine turns, it's going to imagine curves on the highway. And these are going to be very far from the context because we don't condition on anything. We just tell the model to imagine something. Um, so the human path that we have been using so far to train will be irrelevant for sufficiently longer rollouts. Um, so we need to come up with something new. Uh, we don't exactly know what to do and how, and how to do it, but the idea is going to be something close to like a value model uh, that um, like either a GAN loss or something like, uh, like something to minimize this engagement or something to um, basically another model that's trained separately that quantifies whether your rollout, whether your driving is good or not based, based, on, uh, based on the rollout that you're showing it. 
So something like a value model as a loss function instead of just MAE that we've been using for a long time. So what are the next steps? A few uh, weeks ago, we uh, tweeted, sorry, we X'd, uh, we X'd a video of our uh, simulator. Um, and uh, the response, some of the, some of the comments were uh, funny, but uh, most, most of all, they, uh, they really show what we need to work on and what we actually work on. So I'm gonna show some of the comments, the comments on the comments. Uh, Harrison uh, really wants to play this. He says, please let me play it. We wanna play it too, it's really fun. Uh, but as I said, it's at two FPS. You don't wanna play a game at two FPS. So we really want to make this faster. And that's something we're currently working on. We have bounties on it. And um, yeah, we just want to make this faster. John said there is a left turn on red. And uh, uh, this person uh, said, oh, this is a green light. And we know, we know this. We can see. We have eyes too. Uh, this, this potato quality image. And as I said, this is 128 tokens, 10 bits each. So we know there's compression artifacts, but in order to move fast, in order to experiment fast, we're using this now. We'll scale up when we have either better uh, video tokenizers, uh, better sampling strategies. So we will scale up. Uh, we just need to work on these problems first. Leo said, I feel like building the simulator is not that hard. Trust me, Leo. <laughs> Leo, we do things not because they're easy, but because we thought they were easy. <laughs> so this is basically what I've been talking about. Uh, the autoregressive sampling, using, yeah, using, actu actually using the models, scaling the bits and scaling the transformer as well, and uh, we need better video tokenizers. So uh, going back to this slide, these, uh, these beautiful rollouts, I'd like to point out some nice properties. Uh, look at this lead car here, where the, the, the headlights turn on when it stops and then they turn off when it uh, goes on. So it's pretty nice. Uh, some of these rollouts are actually really good. How do you know if this is a fake video or not? This looks really good. This one as well it looks quite nice. Um, in this one, the model takes an exit. In uh, this one, the model takes a, does a lane change, then takes an exit, which is quite interesting. The night videos also look good. Look at these lights, light halos that look really, uh, really uh, realistic. Um, again, fancy buildings, weird, weird looking buildings, as, I sh uh, as I've shown in the, the tokenizer slide, and this is really because the tokenizer is terrible. Um, but yeah, you can see the building move, like it's a really good physics understanding. Uh, the prompt of this image has a cable. Some, some people don't hide the cables from uh, in front of the cameras which is not a big problem, but you can see that the cable stays there, um, pretty consistent in the frames. Uh, this one here, it's a snowy road, and the snow persists uh, after the rollout. So the snow is still there at the end of the rollout, which is really interesting. Uh, in this one, the model just wanna stop and uh, takes a picture, I guess, of, of, uh, of the surrounding. I don't know, maybe a mountain road or something. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is it. This is Drive GPT. Any questions? Wait, you see, we know there's lots of questions. Oh yeah, I forgot. Should we start with those? Who are the people who had the two you seen questions before? Over here. All right, start back here. So you mentioned that you can get like an initial image and then you can also say that move straight or like move right. So are you conditioning on language at all? Like the, the tokens? Um, Okay, so we don't condition our language. Uh, uh, I was talking about the pose, which is the six numbers. Six numbers are essentially moving, so the, your speed, lateral speed, longitudinal speed, and Z, the Z axis. So those are the, the numbers that we use 
to condition the model to go left or right or to go faster or slower. So we have those number baked in the model. So those are special tokens, call them the pose tokens, and those are used to condition. So we can either let the model go free falling. So the, mo the model also, also uh, predicts those tokens. So the model knows which are the most likely next pose. So we can either run the model with those and we, the model will be unconditioned. So we just use those from the model. Or we can just go in and say, tell the model, no, 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 this is not what we want. We want to go right. And then put those tokens in and the output of this thing will be a conditioned video. Does that answer the question? We have a question here. Oh, well, great question. Come through here. Awesome talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the bottlenecks in your pipeline. What's the like top uh, bottlenecks in pipeline to inference it for real time? So these models are quite big, uh, even though they're not as big as ChatGPT and Llama. They're they're a little big, and we, we're currently bottlenecked by software. We're not reaching RAM bandwidth, or not even reaching flops bandwidth. So uh, we're just really bottleneck by good software, inferencing GPT models, transformer models. Uh, currently, we just use Onyx, which is a pretty standard inference engine. Um, and there are some fancy ones that are, that are coming up. And uh, yeah, so currently, we're bottlenecked by, um, by software. Um, when we reach the limits of the software, we'll probably need either to, uh, to do some tricks on the architecture to make it faster um, or just use more GPUs. All right. Thanks for the talk. Um, so uh, eventually, maybe these uh, rollouts will be at least human indistinguishable from real rollouts, yeah? Um, what applications open up when you get there? So the first application we see here is really learning, the learning in this driving simulator. So we want to use this. We replace, completely replace our small offset simulator. And the, the driving model is basically going to live in this world. Uh, and it's going to drive around, go grocery shopping, go to the, the movie theater, and uh, just learn how to drive in this, in this, in this driving simulator. Um, I mean, other applications might pop up, I don't know, like a game or something. <laughs> but uh, for now, we're focused on learning a driving model in the simulator. Um. Are you worried about uh, using too much of this learned uh, simulation in your models and causing a model collapse? A model collapse. Um, so I, I guess you're um, referencing um, training on, iteratively training on models. Um, and that would mo cause a model collapse. Uh, well, that happens when the models are, are the, we have proof that this happened for models that are similar. So let's say you train ChatGPT on ChatGPT data on ChatGPT data, and you do this iteratively, the model will collapse. It also has been shown to exist for image generation data as well. Uh, but the models that we will train here are very different. This model as a simulator is going to, um, is going to basically lear learn how to I imagine driving data. But the model that we'll train on it is a completely different model. It's a model that learns how to drive. So these will be very different, and we're not going to do this iteratively. This is going to be just a one-step process. And uh, we will improve both of the models uh, independently, but there's not going to be any, any iterative process. So we are aware of, of the model collapse, but we don't see it as an issue for now. Um, and uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Hi, I have two questions. One, do you consider use mask or to encoder? that can compress about 90% uh, of the image. And the second one is, you talk about a video encoder. If you use a video encoder, then forward to the uh, transformer model, it should be output also a video as well. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your first question was about masked autoencoders, and that's what I was referring to as masked git or similar approaches to train uh, image tokenizers uh, and such. Uh, we tried. Um, it didn't really work that well. 
Um, but yeah, it didn't really work that well. What worked well is the cleanest solution. The most obvious one worked well. We tried to go fancier and it didn't work. So I guess there's something to learn here. Uh, then your next question was, uh, can you repeat your next question? I forgot. Uh, if you have a video encoder, that means if you put this audio encoder, the code to the transformer, mm -hmm. Okay. If you go to the forward, it should be general ever token is a video. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, so what, what I uh, was referring to as a, vid, as a video decoder is something close to like an I and B frame uh, kind of tokenizer. So some different types of tokenizer. One would, one would be like a, like a general I frame and then a P frame that's a smaller set of tokens or smaller, num basically more compression in the diff frames. So this is what I was referring to as a video, doc, a video encoder. But again, this is something we haven't done yet. And uh, uh, I guess we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what will work and we'll see what other people are trying and uh, try, to, try, to, try to navigate in this, um, in this uh, research area. Um, is the, so it, uh, is, it, is the output from the simulator only is used to train the policy model? Because the way I understand it, there's two models. There's the vision which is like efficient net B2 and then the uh, policy model. Okay, so you're, you're one of the questions from before, right? No? No? Okay. <laughs> so I, I guess I will answer both questions. Um, uh, there was one question before about why we say there's two models while we also say that we're end-to-end. -end. Uh, so there are two models, and uh, when we say we train end-to-end, -end, uh, it's because these two models really have the same loss function. These two models uh, predict the same thing. These two models predict what is the plan, and then uh, they just predict the plan. What, what, and this is the only thing we use. We use the plan from the model. The vision model predicts the plan, and the policy model as well predicts the plan. Now, why do we need two models? We need two models exactly because we need a simulator. So these two models are living in two different worlds. The vision model lives in the real world, and the policy model lives in the simulated world. So we did the split because these two models need to be trained uh, in different worlds. And, um, and yeah, so we're still end-to-end -end because we're not using any bounding boxes. We're not using any perception kind of layer that says oh, these, are, these are traffic lights and such. So, um, so yeah, I, I hope this answers the first question. And uh, the second question, uh, uh, yes, this uh, simulator will, so the policy model will be trained on this, on this simulator, but not, not the vision model. All right. Hey, great presentation. Thank um, you. My question as you, as a researcher, I'm sure you know there's been so many advancements in AI. So my question is regarding how do you balance researching, testing, and you know playing around with all the recent developments in, for example, tokenizers. That's the topic that I want to focus on. You know, all the new tokenizers that come out. How do you focus on testing out and you know, working, playing around with all those new developments from other teams, but also clearly developing your own stuff since you're a researcher, you, you want to build your own stuff. So how, how do you balance? So keeping up with, with state of the art is, is, is pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are, that are happening right now. Machine learning um, is growing very fast. But there's one signal that I've, I've noticed is that I mean, you don't really want to be the first one to replicate a paper. It's, it's, it's kind of a useless thing to do, unless, you really, it's, unless you're doing it to learn, or unless you're, you're doing it to practice, or you're interested in this personally. But if being the first person to replicate, uh, it's not that, that good. So you want to wait for other people to replicate and see, see feel, feel the waters and see if something looks useful or not. And um, usually, this takes about a week or two. People are very active. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, pushing the state of the art. Again, uh, you really want to balance being at the edge of state of the art or pushing it a little far. And uh, I, I come over trying to push it where we need to push it. And uh, there's a lot of researchers outside, outside of Kama. There's a lot of people, a lot of labs that are working on the same problems. And uh, it would be good if they did the work for us, but sometimes they don't. Um, so we try to leverage their work as much as we can. And we also open source our stuff. So it's not like a one-way highway here. Uh, we open source our findings, write blog posts, we 
well published data sets. So when we see the need to push the state of the art, we do it, and then we share it with people. It's not, it's um, yeah, it's just a little line that we need to balance, but uh, but so far works great. Uh, my question is, where do the model names come from? What do Nicki Minaj and Nicolas Cage <laughs> have to do with driving? <laughs> Great question. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. Am I allowed to say it? Let's see, a trade secret. We Sorry. don't have a lot of secrets, but... Trade secret. Sorry. We're going we're gonna to keep these. <laughs> I had some questions about just the tokenizer aspect in general. Like, what motivates to stick to, like, these discrete tokens I'm instead sorry, of... I'm sorry, repeat. Can you What's repeat? the motivation between sticking to, like, this discrete token representation versus, um, like maybe a more regressive, like doing regression? Is that just because like cross entropy loss is so simple and nice or is there something else? And then a couple more questions about the tokens. Is there like some position dependency on those? Have you tried looking at like the interpret, like have you tried interpreting what token 95 means for example? Oh yeah, great questions. So we tokenize because cross entropy is the best loss function. Uh, everyone knows that. <laughs> Whatever else is uh, just a scam doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, cross entropy is the best loss function. It's really simple. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I, I can talk a lot about why cross entropy is, is good, but it's not really the, the talk today. Um, your next question, question was about interpreting the tokens. So these are like visual tokens. So you can, you can like feed an image of just token one, 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 and then see what the decoder says. And uh, these will be like basically colors or basic uh, basic um, um, the patterns or you know zigzags and stuff like that edges and things like that so these are visual patterns and they have they do have positional information um, and uh, the transformer has a posi positional encoding as most transformers uh, I heard that we don't really need these positional encodings but we still have it uh, but yeah they have we can interpret them we can see what each token looks like we can see if our tokenizer is efficient or not we can see if like all token all, all the tokens have been utilized, and all tokens mean different things. So you can somewhat interpret these tokens, and they have positional information as well. Uh, say driving is very different around the world. Uh, I was wondering if you looked into conditioning on geolocation. Uh, that's a good uh, that's a good question. Uh, there's multiple ways we can condition these things. We can condition them on weather. We can condition them on on geolocation, we can condition them on type of car and so, and so on. Uh, we don't really want to go in this detail. We just want to build the most general simulator possible. If someone wants to condition them on, on, uh, on country, look, the data set is open source. Uh, they, can, they can condition them on, on, on countries and, and look at data from uh, Venezuela or from Uganda or anything. So um, yeah, we just want to build the most general simulator. We want to condition it on the least possible things. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious, I know Harold mentioned the long-term goal of Kama being um, from going from just cars to broader areas like robotics. So I was wondering, first of all, if you plan to use the same like GPT style simulator and just how you think it scales to something like robotics where you have more degrees of freedom and maybe a different like distribution of output spaces. Yeah, great question. This is one of the mo main motivators of using this simulator is that it can scale to any type of robotics problem. Um, it has more, di more degrees of freedom, but um, we use the very simple post tokenizers, which is MP digitized. If you have more degrees of freedom, you just use a more fancy tokenizer for that. Um, this really scales to any type of, of, dynam of, of, of robotics problem you wanna, you wanna do. And as you can see, most recent robotics, uh, fancy looking solutions now use something that looks like this. Um, so uh, we're really excited about how we can extend this to uh, something outside of driving as well. Hey, thank you. So yeah, kind of related. So uh, I'm thinking about uh, this scenario. Say uh, this is for uh, this is for the input for the driving model, right? So right now I'm saying, okay, I want to drive from A and to B, for example. Please give me uh, please give me the scenario of driving to the nearest Taco Bell. But this is a language, right? I'm just curious why we don't put language as the, you know, uh, the first input and uh, generate the, you know, actually the driving uh, video scenarios. Yeah, we don't really need language. Um, I mean, we can condition anything with floats, with floating points numbers. Um, language is very inefficient. Um, 
why not use something that has a lot more bits than, uh, than words? Um, we can condition it on text. Some people are doing it. Um, we, we, we really can do it. You can just uh, connect this to an LLM, connect this to Lama 7B, and then put the, put the text and get the embedding and then plug it back into the GPT. That's something we can do. Uh, we haven't been doing this. Uh, I mean, th these are really cool demos, right? They, they're cool for papers. They're, they're fun things to do. Uh, we've really been trying to, to make something as general as possible. And um, yeah, again, if someone wants to do this really easy, um, just uh, you know, plug it back with the Lama 2 and see what happens. It could be a cool project. We got one last question here in the back. Cool. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the temporal consistency aspects? In particular, I mean, the, the training data is temporally consistent. So kind of what's the intuition behind why the predictive model is unable, it like has some flickering, and why it's not able to learn temporal consistency? And then what are the core ideas between, like, I know you had a slide on it, but I didn't quite understand the, the core ideas that enable the loss of flickering. OK, so let me go back to it. It's, it's, it's going to be white, uh, light mode. Um, so why does the model not predict smooth video uh, on its own? Uh, well, because the data is not smooth. The data it's trained on is tokenized frame by frame. So the data that the model is, is, uh, is trained on isn't good. It's fl it flickers. So even the ground truth data of this model flickers. Um, and it flickers because the tokenizer is frame by frame. It doesn't have any temporal memory. It doesn't have any smoothness to it. It just frame by it just it just it flickers, and I mean a, a good question would be why does it flicker? Why, why is it not pretty smooth? And it flickers because just compression, right? We're, we're asking this model to really compress this really hard, um, so um, it will flicker. And we notice that the more bits we use, the less flickering we see. So this is to answer your first question: uh, Why does it flicker? Then uh, the smoothing decoder basically is just sticking an RNN layer, just sticking a layer that has a memory, and uh, at uh, each step, we share that memory to the next step. And then uh, doing this, we, uh, we have like a running state. And doing so, the decoder has more information now and knows how to smooth. Uh, the decoder didn't have that information before, didn't know what happened a second ago, didn't know what happened a frame ago. So it couldn't even smooth. Now it can smooth. And uh, as you can see, uh, it works. Does that answer your question? OK. All right, give it up for Yassine. Thank you.